Hello! It's the second part of a video series going over most of Robin Hartshorn's book, Algebraic Geometry, in a fairly complete manner, as both a visual documentation of everything in the book, a potential reading guide, and a way to force myself to understand the basics of algebraic geometry by teaching it. I'm going to assume that if you're watching this, you've seen the previous video in this series about the section on affine varieties, so I'll keep this brief. Topology and abstract algebra are required knowledge, and the same textbooks recommended in the last lecture are recommended with links in the description. As well, commutative algebra and category theory will be helpful for understanding the heart of a lot of what we do. In this lecture specifically, with many tools being used from commutative algebra, such as localization of a commutative ring by an element, and general results using graded rings. Non-technical results necessary to understanding some of the derivations will be mentioned, although obviously for time they will not be given. Next to finally, none of the concepts are my own original work, and Oliver Lug has a stylish style for me to copy. Finally, the same preliminaries as previously will be assumed for the rest of the series without comment, so if you're wondering why polynomial rings don't mention k, or why the multiplication is always commutative, you're directed back to the preliminary chapter of the previous video to catch up. Now, without further ado, let's continue the series with... Chapter 1. Varieties. Section 2. Projective Varieties. In the last section, we looked at the basics of zero sets of polynomials from a topological perspective. However, we now shift gears into looking at these zero sets from an algebraic perspective, as an algebraic space. For this, we start setting the stage. Let us have an arbitrary polynomial, and we'll write it as a finite sum of arbitrary variables, raised to arbitrary powers, that are multiplied by arbitrary coefficients in our field. Now, to keep this simple, we'll assume that our field we're working over is the complex numbers, and examine this as a function from affine end space to C. Now, these spaces can be very different, so we'll try to find some function from the complex numbers to affine end space and see how these functions interact. From this, start by looking at any arbitrary point in end space, which has coordinates, let's say, p1 up to pn. If we fix this point, then by the fact that end space is a C module, we can define a map i sub p from C to end space by sending a complex number lambda to lambda times p which we see is just coordinate-wise multiplication when we consider lambda as a scalar. With this in place, let us look at the composition of f with i sub p. Substituting i sub p of lambda for each term in the sum representation of f gives us an expression which is ultimately the sum of some scalar in c times lambda to some power, which we notice is just a finite degree polynomial in one variable, lambda. Now, this is where the magic happens. Suppose that the zero set of our original polynomial is closed under addition of zeros. Then, by definition, for any p in the zero set, n times p, which we interpret as repeated addition coordinate-wise, is also in the zero set. However, something beautiful comes out of this. We can interpret this polynomial through the methods of complex analysis, and see that since arbitrarily large multiples of p are zero, then by definition, the limit of f composed with i sub p does not go to infinity as lambda approaches infinity. But realize, since we're talking about an arbitrary finite degree polynomial, we'll get that this composition is actually equal to zero. However, this means that any scalar multiple of a point in the zero set evaluates to zero under this polynomial. Thus, at least in the complex case, if the zero set of a polynomial is closed under addition, then it is closed under scalar multiplication motivating us to think purely about polynomials whose zero sets are closed under scalar multiplication. Now, since we're going to be talking about polynomials whose zero sets have a certain geometric property of being closed under scalar multiplication, we introduce a common visual used for later analysis. Consider C cross C, with R cross R visually shown as in the last lecture. And suppose we have some point, let's say right here, in the zero set of a polynomial. Now, if this polynomial has the earlier described geometric property, this entire line of scalar multiples of this point will be in the zero set. Thus, when talking about these types of polynomials, we look at entire lines. So this line right here and this other line right here are the objects we care about, and they're only represented by points. Say this one here and that one there. 
However, since we can get from one point on the line to the other by just multiplying a scalar, we can generally define the collections of lines in affine n space by looking at the equivalence classes belonging to the same line of points, where two points, call them p1 and p2, are equivalent if there is some scalar lambda such that p1 is equal to lambda p2, uh, at least almost. It should be obvious that we've run into an issue if we want this to be an equivalence relation, as any point multiplied by zero goes to zero. However, notice that this will be the only point that causes problems, so we brute force a definition by literally just getting rid of the zero point, but keeping the equivalence relation. Therefore, we have to modify that equivalence relation very slightly, and this produces enough new structure that it's worth giving explicitly new notation. Let P superscript N be affine n plus 1 space modulo the equivalence relation L, which you can think of as the is in the same line relation, which is defined by saying that two points P1 and P2 are equal if there is a non-zero scalar lambda such that P1 is equal to lambda P2. Note that, looking at the visual, this does properly let us talk about these lines going through the origin, simply without that universal origin point. We call this set projective n space over our base field k. Note two things here. First, as per normal, we are suppressing our base field k from the notation. Second, pn is defined as the equivalence class of the points in affine n plus 1 space, minus the point 0. We'll explain later why it makes sense to have this shift in the value of n, but until then, just remember that slight quirk. Motivated by the desire to look for polynomials that do have this closure of zeros under scalar multiples, we ask the question of what polynomials have zero sets with that property. To answer this, let's have an arbitrary polynomial in an arbitrary field, and we'll start by writing it as before. However, we'll quickly realize that we can do much better than writing it like that, and we'll write it out as a sum indexed by the sum of powers up to the degree of the polynomial, with each term in the summon being a polynomial of degree i sub 1 plus i sub 2 plus all the way to plus i sub n. Now, this is written out in a ridiculously abstract way, so we'll quickly ground ourselves in an example. Suppose we have a polynomial of three variables, which we write out as the following sum. We regroup them as follows. Notice how everything in the first set of parentheses has degree 6, the next polynomials have degree 3, then degree 2, and finally degree 0. Now, let's bring back our previously defined function i sub p, which can be defined for any field, and post-compose it with f. To formally evaluate this, we first expand out f the initial way we did it, then regroup by degrees, and finally bring the precomposition into each individual summoned, which is something that one can quickly check as a valid thing to do. From here, we finally apply the composition, and realize that in each summon, by degree, we can factor out a term of lambda to the power of i sub 1 plus on and on to plus i sub n. Now, we fix a term, call it kappa, which is the minimum term such that the internal summoned is non-zero, that is, the lowest degree term, which is non-zero, we have in our sum. We'll handle the case when kappa doesn't necessarily exist in a bit. This means we can rewrite our polynomial as a sum from i sub 1 plus on and on to plus i sub n equals kappa, up to i sub 1 plus on and on plus i sub n is equal to the degree of f. However, from here, realize something. This means that we can factor lambda to the kappa out of the sum, and by the minimality, this means we can express this polynomial as lambda to the kappa times h of lambda, or some polynomial of one variable lambda with coefficients in k. Notice now, by the definition of kappa, the degree of f is not equal to kappa if and only if h of lambda is non-constant, which one should quickly check makes sense. This means that h of lambda is not equal to zero for all possible lambda, which implies that by the definition of i sub p that started this, and the fact that k is an integral domain, that our zero set is not closed under arbitrary scalar multiplication. Thus, if our zero set is closed under arbitrary scalar multiplication, then the degree of our polynomial is equal to kappa, and it should be easy to in fact see that all such polynomials have zero sets closed under arbitrary scalar multiplication. 
we thus give a name for these polynomials. If f can be written out in the sum of polynomials all of the same degree, including the non-existent kappa case, where f is a constant c in our field k, we say that f is homogeneous of degree degree f. Shortly, we're going to be talking about a lot of structure surrounding these homogeneous polynomials, so we need to define these things more abstractly. First, we'll let s sub d denote the set of all homogeneous polynomials of degree d. Realize that, basically by definition, that we can define our space of polynomials as the direct sum of these homogeneous polynomials. And these polynomials have the properties that s sub d times s sub e is a subset of s sub d plus e. In this situation, we'll say that a is a graded ring. In this more general context, where two properties are satisfied while not necessarily being in the context of polynomials, any f in s sub d is referred to as a homogeneous element of degree d. As well, this allows us to describe particularly simple algebraic subobjects with respect to this grading. Suppose we have some alpha as an ideal of our graded ring such that alpha is equal to its direct sum with respect to intersections of the sets of homogeneous elements. We'll say that alpha is a homogeneous ideal. Now, suppose we have some homogeneous polynomial. Then, by its homogeneity, for any point p, we have that either all scalar multiples of this point evaluate to zero, or that all non-zero multiples of this point do not evaluate to zero since its zero set is close under scalar multiplication. Thus, respective to these cases, we'll say that the equivalence class of our point either evaluates to zero or one, where p is an affine n plus one space, and we're considering its projection in, well, projective space. This gives us a function from projective n space to the set consisting of zero and one, which allows us to define in a similar way to the affine case the zero sets of these homogeneous polynomials in projective space. Now, for any subset of polynomials, we can define its zero sets in the obvious way, except for the fact that we can only talk about homogeneous polynomials. So, we define this as the zero set of all homogeneous polynomials in this collection, which here I've expressed as an intersection. Similar to the affine case, then, this describes algebraic sets, which end up being the closed sets of a topology as you can personally check, which we call the Zariski topology. Now, let's continue by noting a way we can shift our perspective on regular polynomials. Let f be some polynomial, and since keeping track of the number of variables is going to end up being important, let's say that this polynomial is in n variables. Similar to previous arguments, we start by splitting off this polynomial, into the sums of homogeneous polynomials. Now, notice that if we have a homogeneous polynomial of degree less than degree f, we can multiply it by a dummy variable, x sub n plus 1, to make it homogeneous of that degree. So doing that to each individual homogeneous polynomial in the summon gives us a polynomial beta f. Indeed, we go even further with this to realize that this is actually a homogeneous polynomial in n plus 1 variables. From here, we do some algebraic manipulation. From using our normal definition of negative exponents, we can write out each summon in beta f as x sub n plus 1 to the degree of f divided by x sub n plus 1 to the i, all multiplied by f. However, it is important in this case to remember that this will only make sense as an algebraic expression upon application if x sub n plus 1 is not 0, and it makes sense in all such contexts. Keep that in mind, we'll be coming back to that shortly. Now, from here, realize that by homogeneity, when we evaluate each f sub i at a point divided by x sub n plus 1, we raise it to the power i and remove it from the individual term. So ultimately, we get that our polynomial is the sum of the product of x sub n plus 1 to the degree of f times f sub i with its argument divided by x sub n plus 1. However, since this happens universally for each term, we can overall write this as beta f of p as being equal to x sub n plus 1 to the degree of f multiplied by f of p over x sub n plus 1. Now, notice, as a function, this new beta f we have created only evaluates to 0 under the tuple a sub 1 uh, all the way to a sub n plus 1, 
if and only if either a sub n plus 1 is equal to 0, or f of a sub 1 over a sub n plus 1 all the way to a sub n over a sub n plus 1 is equal to 0. Now the input in the second case looks very projective spacey, so let's see if we can make something work here. To ensure that we're in the case with a projective spacey looking term, start by considering the set of projective space minus the subset of projective space with n plus 1 coordinate 0. Before we continue, notice that this is in a special form. It's actually projective space minus the closed set of the polynomial x sub n plus 1. This will be important for later. Now, we make a function from this space to affine n space to replicate the desired term, where we send the point with homogeneous coordinates a sub 1 all the way to a sub n plus 1 to a a sub 1 over a sub n plus 1 all the way to a sub n over a sub n plus 1. This ends up being well defined on equivalence classes, since any multiple of our term has a lambda in both the numerator and denominator, which is cancelled out. In fact, this function becomes very strong. Let t be an arbitrary subset of polynomials in n variables. From what we saw before then, and the if and only if condition, the inverse of its zero set is exactly equal to u sub n plus 1, intersected with the zero set of the image of this set under beta. This tells us that this function is actually continuous under our Zariski topologies. Now, giving it a little thought, this function is even more, it's bijective, so we can ask the question, is this function a homeomorphism? To answer this question, take some homogeneous polynomial in n plus 1 variables. We can make an arbitrary polynomial in n variables by just fixing that final variable as 1, a transformation we'll denote as alpha. From here, it's easy to see that the image of u sub n plus 1 intersected with an arbitrary homogeneous zero set of a collection of polynomials labeled t under phi sub n plus 1 is going to be the zero set of the image of t under alpha. Thus, phi sub n plus 1 is open, and as such bicontinuous, so that we actually have a homeomorphism from this open subset of projective n space to affine n space. However, it gets even better. We can generalize this process, so we can define an arbitrary phi sub i from the open subset of projective n space minus the zero set of the homogeneous polynomial x sub i by simply doing our previous process but replacing a sub n plus 1 with a sub i, and each of these will be homeomorphisms by similar logic. And since a point is only in projective n space if one of the coordinates is non-zero, we conclude by realizing that projective n space is covered by open affine n spaces. For those reading along in the textbook, while well, you're not required to if you are, welcome, and yes, we are in the exercises, and yes, there is that much of the video left. Now my philosophy towards the exercises is going to be as follows. I'm not necessarily interested in providing complete answers to all of the exercises. A lot of times I view these exercises as more valuable for the way they can expand the way you solve problems related to algebraic geometry than as simply just a repository of things to do with your skills. So I'll be going over a lot of the rough drafts of the way you would solve many of these problems in the exercises. Many will be incomplete. In particular, I'm going to go over a dimension result with a homogeneous coordinate ring that is ultimately just a sketch, with most of the results left to dimension juggling to actually figure out. If you want to fill in the details, please do. These are very good exercises to train yourself but I am not going to be going over everything in absolute detail. Just a disclaimer before we start. We continue by restating a lot of the definitions from the affine case with a new coat of projective paint. First, similar to last time, we'll call an irreducible closed subset of projective end space a projective variety, and we'll call an open subset of a projective variety a quasi-projective variety. As well, for a subset W of projective end space, we can define the dimension perfectly well as for last time, but since we can only define evaluation on points of W by homogeneous polynomials, we'll define the ideal of W in a similar way to affine space, except noting that it's the ideal generated by the homogeneous polynomials that all points of W evaluate to zero under. We then define the normal homogeneous coordinate ring of W in the expected way. Now, when working with projective space, things are usually similar but end up being off, and it has a lot to do with the following. First of all, and luckily normally for us, 
are normal results of order reversing zero sets, order reversing ideals, and union swapping with intersections of ideals, stay the same in the projective case. Now we look at the Nullstellensatz. Let us have a homogeneous polynomial f along with a homogeneous ideal alpha. Now, let's suppose we have that f of p is equal to zero for all the p in the zero set of alpha. Suppose now that alpha is not just equal to the set of all polynomials in n plus one variables. With this in mind, consider the affine zero set of alpha, which is just a collection of all points whose projections are in the zero set of the projective case along with the point zero. Now, Notice that by homogeneity, this function is going to have a zero at exactly the point zero, considering of course the degree of our polynomial is strictly non-zero. Thus, if the degree of our polynomial is non-zero, and f of p is zero for all of our projective points in the zero set of our ideal, our original Nullstellensatz says that f will be in the radical of alpha. This result is referred to in this text and some others as the homogeneous Nullstellensatz. Alrighty, that degree non-zero condition seems like it will cause some pathological scenarios, but let's continue as far as we can for now. Suppose that the zero set of alpha in projective space is strictly non-empty. Then, by similar previous arguments, the ideal of the zero set is again the radical of alpha, as one should prove. As well, for any arbitrary subset of projective space, we again get that the zero set of the ideal of y ends up being the closure of y, as one should also prove. Now, we can't keep dancing around that homogeneous Nullstellensatz condition further. Let S plus be the direct sum of all homogeneous polynomials and n plus 1 variables of non-zero degree. Notice that, since zero isn't included in projective space, the zero set of S plus is equal to the zero set of all polynomials consider, which is just the empty set. However, one can directly check that the ideal of the empty set is equal to our entire space. Thus, since S plus will never naturally come up again in any zero set ideal correspondences, we call it the irrelevant maximal ideal of S. With this in mind, we realize that by computation similar to last lecture, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence of relevant radical ideals of S and closed sets of projective space. Now, before we continue, it's time for another commutative algebra break. Suppose that we have two terms in a graded ring, each the scaled sum of homogeneous elements. Then, looking at the product, the homogeneous elements get multiplied together and summed, but by our previous definition of a graded ring, these summons of products are still homogeneous. Now, suppose we have an ideal alpha, such that f times g being an alpha implies either f or g is an alpha, for specifically homogeneous f and g, i.e. a regular weakening of the primality condition for an ideal. Then, by considering the previous statement deeply, if alpha is homogeneous, then it is prime. So functionally weak primality plus homogeneity implies primality. Now, to end this section quickly, we return to our previously derived correspondence. What we have just shown can be used to show that a closed set y is irreducible if and only if its ideal is prime, mainly by the fact that ideals are those generated by homogeneous polynomials, so that projective end space itself can be shown to be irreducible. Now we can continue to prove similar statements, but we'll start approaching these statements in a way that will eventually become much more powerful and start showing some considerations for the locality of things that will eventually culminate in sheaf theory. First, we'll consider the general setting of a topological space, and we'll look at the case that we have a finite open cover of x by Neuwirthian subspaces. Now, suppose that we have a decreasing sequence of closed sets. Then, we consider the intersections of these closed sets with our open covers, which are closed subsets of the covers themselves. So by the fact that our covers are Neuwirthian, we'll have that these are eventually stable in the first index, and we'll explicitly denote when they become stable by the variable nj, where j ranges over the variables of the cover. Now, consider n, the maximum of these nj. By definition, this number is finite by our previous finiteness assumption, and z sub i will be equal to z sub n for j greater than i by the fact that our previous family is a covering one. You should quickly draw this out if this argument doesn't intuitively click. Thus, 
we get that x is Newarthian. So in particular, projective space is Newarthian, since it has to cover by Newarthian affine spaces. Now, let's get an even stronger result. Suppose that we have an open cover of our space x. If we have a chain of closed irreducible subsets of x, we start by noticing that by the fact we have a cover, the bottom of the chain has non-empty intersections with some open set that we have as well. When we note that the intersection of a closed irreducible set with an open set is still closed and irreducible, this gives us that the chain still strictly increases. So we have a closed irreducible strictly increasing chain in the open set that contains the bottom. Thus, iterating over all possible open sets and using the definitions of closed subsets of a subset, we can ultimately get that the dimension of our space is actually the supremum of all these open subsets. So in particular, since projective n space is covered by open spaces of dimension n, this gives us that the dimension of projective n space is n, justifying the n in the name dimension theoretic wise. Now, while the justification is nice, it seems like it'll throw a hitch into our normal use of using the dimension of the coordinate ring in order to get the dimension of a variety, since we use polynomials of n plus 1 variables in a space of dimension n. So let's examine that more closely. Start with an arbitrary projective variety y, and consider initially how its dimension is at least the dimension of y intersected with u sub i, with u sub i the complement of the zero set of the homogeneous polynomial x sub i as previously. Now, we'll assume for convenience that y intersected with u sub i is non-empty. From here, we apply our previous homeomorphism to get that the dimension of y intersected with u sub i is the dimension of its image. And by letting the image of this be denoted by y sub i, we can ultimately say, by our results in the last section, that it is equal to the dimension of the affine coordinate ring of y sub i. Now, this almost begs for us to be able to establish an algebraic relation between the affine coordinate ring of y sub i and the homogeneous coordinate ring of y for dimension theoretic results, so we'll focus on sketching out that. First, because we're going to be doing some more polynomial juggling, we'll explicitly let s be the ring of all n plus 1 variable polynomials, and a the ring of polynomials missing the ith variable in the context of y sub i. Now, we already have some function beta sub i from a to s, mainly the homogenization of the polynomial, so this will give us a great place to work from if we can commute with its projection into the coordinate ring. To check this, suppose we start with two polynomials in the same equivalence class in the affine coordinate ring. Then we'd want it to obviously be the case that beta i of f and beta i of g are still in the same equivalence class by just passing between and commuting. However, when we expand out the definitions, while the individual polynomials are the same when we formally allow for us to divide their variables by x sub i, we can't confirm a priori whether the degrees will match up to make them of the same equivalence class. Now, if we were able to formally divide the degrees, then by the previously assumed equivalences, these two functions would be equal. But wait, the desired term has the form of a formal quotient, and is actually a term in the localization of our homogeneous coordinate ring by the polynomial x sub i, so that if we redefine beta sub i on the equivalence class of f to being beta sub i of f, all right, that was nice past me, but you made a slight bungle in your notation here, and you wrote this out until the end of the production line. Good job. So that exploration of beta i is super useful for finding the general form that we should be looking for, um, but I messed it up. It should just be f divided by x sub i to the degree of f. Um, we should not have a beta i here. I'm going to keep this in the rest of the notation, um, and I'm just going to play out the rest of these slides, just talk over them. Yeah, everything else should be right in terms of especially the dimension juggling and the isomorphism stuff, but currently this is just kind of bad right here. Okay, we should be good. Let's keep going. And if we consider the quotient of 1 by x sub i to have degree negative 1, this gives us the identification of our affine coordinate ring as the subring of degree 0 elements of the localization of the homogeneous coordinate ring. From here, 
if we further formally expand beta sub i to send the formal polynomial x sub i to the equivalence class of our actual polynomial x sub i, one can check that beta sub i is an isomorphism between the affine coordinate ring of y sub i, with the variable x sub i and its own inverse formally appended, and the homogeneous coordinate ring of y localized at x sub i. Thus, we note the obvious given by the isomorphism, that the dimension of the localization is equal to the dimension of the formally appended affine coordinate ring. Basic dimension theory will then tell you that this is the dimension of the affine coordinate ring plus 1, which by homeomorphism is equal to the dimension of the intersection of y with u sub i plus 1. Now, bringing back our assumption that y intersected with u sub i is not empty, we get that x sub i is not in the ideal of y, so that's some basic dimension theory later, will once again tell you that the dimension of the homogeneous coordinate ring is equal to the dimension of its localization at x sub i. Thus, we conclude that the dimension of the homogeneous coordinate ring is equal to the dimension of y intersected with u sub i plus 1, and since open subsets like these form an open cover of y, we have that the dimension of y is equal to the supremum of these, and since if y intersected with u sub i is, not, uh, is empty, then it has dimension less than that of the cover which is non empty, we get that overall in all cases, the dimension of the homogeneous coordinate ring is equal to the dimension of y plus 1. As well, this tells us that the dimension of y will equal the dimension of any y sub i by this invariance, at least in the case when y sub i is non empty. Let's try to explore this discrepancy in the dimension a bit more geometrically. First, let's backtrack. Let theta be the function that projects from affine n plus 1 space, minus 0, to the projective n space. Now, for y a subset of projective space, let c of y be the collection of points that project onto y, along with a point 0. We'll call this the affine cone over y. Now, this is a very nice algebraic property. Let y be the projective zero set of a subset of polynomials labeled t. Then, letting t prime be the collection of all homogeneous polynomials in t, notice that the affine cone is equal to the affine zero set of t prime union with the zero vector. With this information, the ideal of the affine cone, taking note of how we compute the ideals of unions, is the ideal of the zero set of t prime intersected with the ideal of the zero vector which by our previous identities is actually just the intersection of the radical of the ideal generated by t prime with the irrelevant maximal ideal. However, a quick computation should tell you something. This is just the ideal of y. Thus, keeping this explicit equivalence in mind tells us the affine coordinate ring of cy is actually equal to the homogeneous coordinate ring of y. This, with the combination of most things so far, actually tells us that if the affine cone is irreducible, and the set it came from is irreducible and vice versa, at least for y-algebraic, so that in particular, cy is an affine variety if and only if y is a projective variety. Thus, keeping in mind the formulas for dimension and everything discussed dimension-wise so far, if y is a projective variety, then the dimension of cy equals the dimension of y plus 1. However, this extends even farther beyond the variety case as follows. First, we'll be keeping two important considerations about the cone construction in mind. First, the cone strictly respects inclusion of subsets. Second, unions commute with the cone construction. Now, if y is an algebraic subset of projective space, by the fact it is Neworthian, we can write it as the union of irreducible closed subsets. In this case, each a projective variety and having no containment between each other. Now, by the union property, we can write c of y as the union of these c of y sub i, each of which by previous mention is irreducible. As well, the restriction on strict containment means that these irreducible affine cones will also follow that strict containment, which is a really good exercise to see why. Thus, we have that the cones of the irreducible components are the irreducible components of the cone, and notably, from that, we have that the dimension of the cone is the maximum of the dimension of these components, which by the previous mention of the variety case is the maximum dimension of the varieties plus 1, which by the fact that they are either irreducible components mean that it is actually equal to the dimension of the original algebraic set plus 1, generalizing our previous result 
and showing on a more geometric level why this discrepancy occurs. To end the lecture part of the video, we set up one of the most powerful future tools for future reference. To start, suppose we have some point in projective R space and some other point in projective S space. Note here that for this, when we write points in projective space, we'll be dropping the equivalence class notation and just writing out the coordinates of a representative. Now, in the first point, there by definition must be some coordinate a sub i not equal to zero. And in the second, there must be some coordinate b sub j also not equal to zero. However, since our field is an integral domain, this means that a sub i times b sub j will not be equal to zero. Thus, doing a coordinate wise multiplication for each coordinate written in lexicographical order as follows will give us a point in projective n space, where n is equal to r plus 1 times s plus 1 minus 1, which is just equal to rs plus r plus s. Now, it is easy to see that this is well defined on equivalence classes with respect to both projective r space and projective s space. So this defines a well defined map from projective r space times projective s space to projective n space. Note here that the product is the regular set base Cartesian product. This will be referred to as the Seagray embedding. Now, it will be left as a good exercise for the reader to do that this map is injective, justifying it being named an embedding, but is it more? What does the image embed onto? Perhaps, is the image a projective variety? To answer this, we'll need some new notation. We'll write the variables corresponding to coordinates of projective space as follows, in, again, lexicographical order. To cement this notation, notice how we normally label the variables corresponding to the two main coordinates in P1 by x1 and x2. From here, by how we mapped into Pn in the first place, we consider the inverse by mapping z sub ij to x sub i times y sub j. Considering this over all the z sub ij, this defines a homomorphism from the polynomials in variables from z ij to variables in x sub i and y sub j. Now, one can quickly see that if we define alpha as the kernel of this function, then by substitution, any point in the image will be in the zero set of alpha, and the census condition must hold obviously by definition of the embedding. Now, the important question, is the zero set of alpha a subset of the image? Answering this is subtle and a little tedious, so we'll take it step by step. We'll start with an observation. Start by notating each coordinate as follows. Subscripts again in lexicographical order, I dearly apologize. Suppose that this point is in the zero set of alpha, and thus importantly, in Pn. This condition is important, since we can explicitly say that there is some P sub ij that is non-zero. From here, we'll explicitly write out what we're looking for. We're looking for points a sub 1 to a sub r plus 1 in projective r space, and b sub 1 to b sub s plus 1 in projective s space, such that a sub n times b sub m equals p sub n m, by the definition of the C-Gray embedding. Now, start by noticing that the rule just described implies that p sub i j equals the product of a sub i by b sub j. But since earlier we specified that p sub i j is non-zero, this implies that both a sub i and b sub j are non-zero, so that we can ultimately write a sub i as a quotient of p sub i j by b sub j. Now, notice that for any p sub i m, by the previous rule we want to hold, must equal a sub i times b sub m, but by substitution is just equal to the product of p sub i j divided by b sub j all times b sub m. Now, multiplying things out respectively, gives us that b sub m is equal to some quotient multiplied by p sub i m. Similarly, any a sub n will be equal to some quotient times p sub n j. Thus, if we fix a sub i and b sub j, this will give us definite values for our purposes. We'll for now just let a sub i equal p sub i j and b sub j equal 1, which can very easily be seen to be a valid combination for at least p sub i j. This will then tell us that a sub n equals p sub n j, and b sub m equals p sub i m divided by p sub i j. Now, we need to check that this combination actually produces our desired point under the C-Gray embedding, specifically that a sub n times b sub m 
equals p sub n m. For this, we start by explicitly computing a sub n times b sub m as p sub n j times p sub i m divided by p sub i j. From here, we seem to be at an impasse, but let's remember that we have phi to think about to possibly give us more constraints. First, notice that phi of z sub a b times z sub c d as abstract polynomials is mapped to x sub a times y sub b times x sub c times y sub d. However, note that we can shuffle the y's to be equal to x sub a times y sub d times x sub c times y sub b, which is actually equal to the image of phi under z sub a d times z sub c b. This will ultimately mean, by linearity, that z sub a b times z sub c d minus z sub a d times z sub c b is in the kernel of phi. However, remember that at the very beginning of this computation, we assume that our point is in the zero set of this kernel. Thus, one can quickly see that this means p sub a b times p sub c d is actually equal to p sub a d times p sub c b. Applying this to the situation we were stuck in, let's us switch the subscripts to ultimately cancel out the p sub i j, ultimately leaving us with p sub n m as required. Thus, the zero set of alpha will end up a subset of the image of the C gray embedding, so that ultimately the zero set of alpha will be the image of the embedding, leaving us with a powerful conclusion that the set-based Cartesian product of projective spaces has the structure of a projective variety. That formally ends the lecture part of the video, so let's quickly review everything we learned. First, we looked at when polynomials have zero sets with nice algebraic properties, which led us to developing projective space. Then, using the graded structure of polynomial rings, we develop notions for algebraic sets for these spaces of zeros, letting us define projective varieties. From there, we looked at how this topology ends up being a twisted patchwork of affine spaces, allowing us to define results globally by looking locally, and concluded by looking at how the set theoretic pro uh, product of projective spaces was in disguise a projective variety itself. Next chapter, much longer a lecture than the previous two have been, as we explore morphisms between variety and begin studying in broader strokes the category in which we wish to work, while also considering this in combination with the topology to give us multiple invariants to later study, with a specific prelude on rational maps. And this is where I go off on my rant. Wow, thank you all so much. No, actually, thank you specifically if you're hearing this. The meant to be. Shorter video compared to the last one still took an extraordinarily long time to make. Please check the document for the script and the slides if you do not believe me. And it's awesome to have people here, willing to learn, through even an unideal format. I urge you, if you want to start educational content, want to share something niche and don't know where to start, please give yourself that chance to just jump out there and make something. Steal my format, steal my style if you need to. Just give yourself that opportunity. Because I love seeing people make things they love from the bottom of their hearts, even when they don't know if someone's going to listen. Enough stalling, though. Considering how long this video took to make and the fact that the next search is likely going to be way longer, how long should I expect to wait? Eh, hopefully not long, since winter break is coming up for classes, but still a minute since I'm finishing up this college term. Although, I'll still as always be grinding it in the background. Until I have it done, though. See ya. Take it as easy as you can.